everyone, welcome back to Intro to Sociological Theory. This week we'll be learning about Anna Julia Cooper and Ida B. Wells Barnett. Anna Julia Cooper, born Anna Julia Haywood, was born in 1858 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Her mother, Hannah Stanley Haywood, was a slave. Stanley didn't want to name Cooper's father, but he's assumed to be either George Washington Haywood, Stanley's slave owner, or his brother, Fabius Haywood. Her status as the daughter of a white man allowed her certain privileges, such as the ability to attain a high quality education that were not available to most black Americans at the time. Despite laws forbidding that slaves were taught to read, Cooper was able to read and write by age seven. It's not known how she acquired these skills as her mother and brother's literacy was limited. Nonetheless, her literacy allowed her to pursue formal education. Cooper worked as a domestic servant in the Haywood household until age eight, when she was awarded a scholarship for St. Augustine's Normal School and Collegiate Institute. The scholarship was offered by Reverend J. Brinton, one of the school's founders, and St. Augustine's was founded by Episcopal clergy in 1867 for the education of freed slaves. It focused on preparing its men for the ministry and had a special track for women. Although girls and women were discouraged from pursuing higher level courses, Cooper fought for her right to take these courses by demonstrating her ability. She met her husband, George A.C. Cooper, at St. Augustine's, but he died only two years into their marriage. This may have been a blessing in disguise for Cooper, as she would likely not have been able to pursue her intellectual work if her husband had lived, as she would have been expected to prioritize raising children. After her husband's death, Cooper attended Oberlin College in Ohio, where she again received an education that had traditionally only been offered to men. She graduated in 1884, briefly taught at Wilberforce College, and then returned to Oberlin to earn her master's in mathematics in 1888. Cooper moved to Washington, D.C. in 1892, where she formed the Colored Women's League along with Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Bailey, Evelyn Shaw, Mary Jane Peterson, Helen Apo Cook, and Charlotte Fortin Grimk. In 1900, she visited Europe to attend the first Pan-African Conference in London. While living in DC, Cooper taught Latin at the Washington Colored High School, or M Street School, which was the only black high school in Washington, DC. And then she became the principal in 1901. She eventually left the school due to conflict over differing attitudes about black education. Cooper advocated for the classical education espoused by W.E.B. Du Bois, which would, quote, prepare eligible students for higher education and leadership, rather than the vocational program that was promoted by Booker T. Washington. She also delivered many speeches calling for civil rights and women's rights. Cooper began PhD studies in 1914, but was forced to drop out after just one year after her late half-brother's wife died and she adopted all five of their children. She decided to transfer to University of Paris Sorbonne and eventually earned her PhD in 1924 after 10 years of research and coursework. Cooper defended her thesis, The Attitude of France on the Question of Slavery between 1789 and 1848 in 1925. After working for the Washington Colored High School, in 1930, Cooper retired from this position and accepted a position as president of Freling Houston University, an adult education university that provided continuing education to working African Americans at hours that didn't interfere with their employment. And when the university was unable to pay their mortgage, she moved it to her own house. During her time at M Street High School, Cooper completed her first book, a Voice from the South by a Black Woman of the South, published in 1892, and delivered many speeches calling for civil rights and women's rights. Its central thesis was that the educational, moral, and spiritual progress of Black women would improve the general standing of the entire African American community. She said that the violent natures of men often run counter to the goals of higher education, so it's important to foster more female intellectuals because they will bring more elegance to education. This view was criticized by some as submissive to the 19th century cult of true womanhood, but others label it as one of the most important arguments for black feminism in the 19th century. <laughs>
Ida B. Wells Barnett was born in 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi, to James Madison Wells and Elizabeth Warrington. Unlike Cooper, both of Wells Barnett's parents were slaves. However, her father, James's father, was a white man, while his mother was a slave. Wells Barnett's mother, Elizabeth, was born on a plantation in Virginia. Less about her lineage is known since she was separated from her parents and nine siblings when she was sold away from them. Before the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, Wells Barnett and her family were enslaved to Spires Bowling, who was an architect. The family lived at what is now called Bowling Gatewood House, which has become the Ida B. Wells Barnett Museum. Wells Barnett attended the historically black liberal arts college, Rust University in Holly Springs. She attended until 1876 when the yellow fever epidemic hit. Her parents tragically died in this epidemic, leaving her to care for her younger siblings as the oldest of five. Wells Barnett began teaching at a black elementary school in Holly Springs with the help of her paternal grandmother, Peggy Wells. In 1883, after Peggy Wells died of a stroke, Wells Barnett moved with her two youngest sisters to Memphis to stay with her aunt Fanny. She then worked at a school in Woodstock and attended classes at Fisk University in Nashville during the summers, as well as Lemoyne Owen College in Memphis, both historically black colleges. Wells Barnett held very strong political beliefs and was often provoked for her views on women's rights. On May 4, 1884, a train conductor ordered Wells to give up her seat in the first class ladies car and move to the smoking car. The previous year, the Supreme Court had ruled against the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1875, which had banned racial discrimination in public accommodations. This verdict supported railroad companies that chose to racially segregate their passengers. When Wells refused to give up her seat, the conductor and two men dragged her out of the car. Wells Barnett later wrote a newspaper article for The Living Way, a black church weekly, about her treatment on the train, and sued and won her case in December of 1884. However, in 1887, the railroad company appealed to the Tennessee Supreme Court, which reversed the lower court's ruling. Wells Barnett's reaction to the higher court's decision revealed her strong convictions on civil rights and religious faith, and was the catalyst for her activist work. While continuing to teach elementary school, Wells Barnett became increasingly active as a journalist and writer. She worked as an editor for the Evening Star in Washington, D.C., and wrote weekly articles attacking racist Jim Crow policies for the Living Way newspaper under a pen name. In 1889, she became editor and co-owner with J.L. Fleming of the Free Speech and Headlight, a Black-owned newspaper established by the Reverend Taylor Nightingale and based at the Beale Street Baptist Church in Memphis. In 1891, she was dismissed from her teaching post by the Memphis Board of Education due to her articles that criticized conditions in the Black schools of the region. So she concentrated her energy on writing articles for The Living Way and The Free Speech and Headlight. Wells Barnett was highly outspoken against lynching, and after the lynching of her friends Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and William Stewart, she urged Black residents to leave Memphis entirely. In 1892, Wells Barnett began to publish her research on lynching in a pamphlet titled Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. Having examined many accounts of lynchings due to the alleged rape of white women, she concluded that Southerners cried rape as an excuse to hide their real reasons for lynchings, black economic progress, which threatened white Southerners with competition, and white ideas of enforcing black second-class citizen status in the society. Black economic progress was a contemporary issue in the South, and in many states, whites worked to suppress black progress. In this period at the turn of the century, Southern states, starting with Mississippi in 1890, passed laws and or new constitutions to disenfranchise most black people and many poor white people through use of poll taxes, literary tests, and other devices. Wells Barnett traveled twice to Britain in her campaign against lynching, the first time in 1893 and the second in 1894. She found sympathetic audiences in Britain who were shocked by reports of lynching in America. She received significant coverage in the British and American press, but many of the articles published at the time of her return to the United States were hostile personal critiques rather than reports of her anti-lynching positions and beliefs. In 
For example, the New York Times called her slanderous and nasty, nasty minded. Despite these attacks in the white press, Wells had nevertheless gained extensive recognition and credibility and an international audience of white supporters of her cause. On June 27, 1895, Wells married attorney Ferdinand L. Barnett. A prominent attorney, Barnett was a civil rights activist and a journalist in Chicago. Like Wells, he spoke widely against lynchings and for the civil rights of African Americans. Wells and Barnett had met in 1893, working together on a pamphlet protesting the lack of black representation at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Wells's marriage to Barnett was a legal union as well as a partnership of ideas and actions. Both were journalists and both were established activists with a shared commitment to civil rights. In an interview, Wells's daughter, Alfreda, said that the two had like interests and that their journalistic careers were intertwined. This sort of close working relationship between a wife and husband was unusual at the time, as women often played more traditional domestic roles in a marriage. Cooper and Wells Barnett were part of the first generation to grow up post-emancipation, so they were both heavily influenced by the discourse of the time. As the textbook mentions, the African American community was working towards redefining themselves under the new post-emancipation conditions. One assumption of this community was that white domination and white supremacy had to be confronted. African American women were confronted with a particularly challenging alignment due to multiple axes of oppression, by both race and gender, and to a lesser extent, social class. Many black women recognized that their race was typically their strongest identifier in white society, and that their gender was the second. Furthermore, their social class and individual attainment often went unnoticed, and was rarely enough to outshine the other two identities as it did, perhaps, for wealthy white women. The textbook authors identify four shared themes in Cooper's and Wells Barnett's social theory. Both helped form the beginnings of a black feminist sociology, and both focus on a pathological interaction between difference and power in the United States. The first theme is the creation of sociology from the standpoint of the oppressed. And for them, the project of social analysis is justice and the method is cross-examination. For both scholars, their social analysis was fueled by a resistance to oppression. They believed in witnessing what was happening in society as a means to empower the African-American community, exposing the oppressors, and appealing to the conscience of potentially supportive publics. Both Cooper and Wells Barnett believed that the portrayal of African-Americans in U.S. society was deeply flawed and untrue, and they saw it as their responsibility to rectify these untruths. Cooper and Wells Barnett utilized two principles in their work whether the actors in the situation are true to their professed principles, and whether the actors in the situation conform to the analyst's own principles of just behavior. For Cooper, truth was rooted in religion. Cooper believed that the white Americans held certain moral ideals in their personal lives, which were derived from religious thought. Yet in their civil and political lives, these morals were not applied. Similar to Martineau, Wells Barnett critiqued those who professed principles that did not align with their own actions. In American society, she saw the hypocritical nature of professing ideals of democracy while practicing action that was contrary to democracy. Not only this, but she criticized those who failed to speak out against practices that were in clear violation of these principles. Cooper and Wells Barnett were faced with the challenge of doing research from the position of a subordinate group without the resources the dominant groups possessed. So they developed a critical and forensic empiricism in which they established their own standpoint, gave their own accounts, as well as the accounts of other subordinates, and used this to challenge the dominant group's claims about the facts. They presented data from their own direct observations of situations and events, such as the Jim Crow laws and norms in public society, their travels to other countries, or conditions in the cities in which they lived and of barriers to education for African-American women. The second is that Cooper and Wells Barnett analyzed situations at hand in terms of the degree to which difference and power acted pathologically as domination or justly as equilibrium. Cooper's and Wells Barnett's view of social life was that power and difference by race, class, gender, and geopolitical position 
affected life outcomes for individuals and for groups. The difference between domination and equilibrium was in whether one interest, class, race, society, or individual is able to dominate another and whether conflicts are resolved by negotiation. In societies that were characterized by equilibrium, one group did not dominate another, and there is a balance in group access to material resources as well as the will to mobilize these resources. These two situations were not morally neutral for Wells Barnett and Cooper, who both believed that domination was wrong and that a belief in justice could not coexist with a belief in domination. The third theme is that domination is a system of oppression and privilege patterned by five factors history, ideology, material resources, manners, and passion. These factors explained the persistence of domination. First, for both Cooper and Wells Barnett, analysis of cases must be historically specific in order to be analyzable, for domination does not exist outside of history. So it is imperative to analyze the historical specificity of certain settings and events. Second, ideologies distort and exaggerate selected differences between people. Specifically, white supremacy is the ideology that Wells Barnett focused on, while social Darwinism, especially the notion of survival of the fittest, was Cooper's focus. Cooper and Wells Barnett argued that the ideological practice of using difference to create otherness employs several criteria for the subordination of others, most notably by race, class, and gender. Here we see the emergence of what Patricia Hill Collins later termed the matrix of domination, which both oppresses and privileges by these axes. Third, domination also exists in the realm of material resources, including violence, production, the knowledge that makes production possible, and communication. Both Cooper and Wells Barnett described the ways in which whites control the basic means of production, capital, commerce, transportation, and technical skill. Material resources provided important means to justify violent acts against African Americans. Fourth, manners legitimized domination through routinization and reproduction in everyday interaction. Expectations of civility are only seen as extending to one's equals, for example, among whites to whites. So dominant groups will enact distance between themselves and their subordinates as a sign of their superiority. Finally, domination rests on emotion, specifically a passion for absolute control. Wells Barnett saw the emotion displayed by whites during lynching to be the result of unbridled power, intensified by any threat to itself or any manifestation of autonomy by the subordinates. The fourth theme is that Cooper and Wells Barnett argue for a society that is patterned by coexistence or equilibrium rather than domination. Their alternative to domination is a society characterized by conflict between competing interests and contrasting ideals of opposing groups, but that all groups are sufficiently equal in power resources in order to prevent domination. Wells Barnett and Cooper believed that subordinate groups must use whatever economic resources available to them in order to force the dominant to concede. Cooper adds to this by advocating for coalition groups between subordinates particularly women and people of color. Cooper also saw black women's role in this coalition building as essential, for the black woman represents the voice of the weakest in power, yet the most enduring in spirit.